Thank you. Hello. How are you? Great to see you. It's great to be in Illinois. Now, normally when I want to visit Midwesterners in February, I just go to Naples, but um, I figured we had to do Sheriff. That's a heck of an introduction. He knows my stuff better than I know my stuff. Man, thank you for doing that research. Do we have any Florida residents in the house today? We have a few? Okay. What about Florida property owners? We got any in the house? Yeah. Now, here's the big one. Do we have any future Florida residents? In? All right. Well, I'll tell you, I run into them all the time. Uh, you, you'd be surprised uh, just how many. So we're, great, we're thankful to be able to be here to deliver a very important message, uh, a message about the importance of safe communities, the rule of law, and by standing by the people that wear the uniform and put themselves at risk to protect us. I'm very proud of what we've been able to do in Florida. I have a laundry list of things that I can brag about. We're the fastest growing state in all the United States. We are number one for net in-migration every year since I've been governor. Illinois, of course, is having a lot of out-migration. We're number one in economic freedom. We're number one in new business formations. Of course, we're number one in tourism. We're number one in GDP growth amongst all large states. Number one in education freedom. Number one. <laughs> Number one for parental involvement in education. We have one of the lowest per capita tax burdens of any state in the country, and of course, no state income tax. Wouldn't you like to have that here in Illinois? We have one of the lowest debt per capita burdens uh, anywhere in the country, and we currently enjoy a record budget surplus. So you see what we've been able to do, unemployment rates a point, point and a half lower, than the national average. I'm sure it's much lower than here in Illinois. And people are always coming. And there's a lot of reasons why people come, and not just to, to, to move, but to visit. Although it is incredible, uh, as a governor, a lot of these governors will call businesses, please come to my state, please come. They call me and tell me they're coming to my, I, I don't have to pick up and do that. We've got people that want to move operations in Florida. We've got individuals that come and move and end up becoming part of our communities. And yes, the taxes make a big difference. From a business perspective, we have a regulatory climate. We actually want you to succeed. I'm not trying to make life difficult for you. Yes, during COVID, even though your governor would lock you down and have his family in Florida living and free, and many other lockdown politicians would do that. It became like a cottage industry that they'd always end up uh, attacking Florida, that we were somehow being reckless by letting people make their decisions. Then you'd see them down in Palm Beach, or you'd see them down in Miami. So that was something that, but people come, yes, because they did want to flee some of the COVID insanity that was going on in many of these other jurisdictions. But I'll tell you, uh, there's no way Florida could have done what we've done if it wasn't for our commitment to law and order. And the fact that we've stood by people when it wasn't popular, it's the foundation for the success of not just Florida, but for any community, because you're not going to have a good economy if the streets aren't safe. You're not going to have good education if people don't feel safe. None of it works unless you have the foundation of public safety. And as the sheriff mentioned, as you see massive increases in crime in places like Los Angeles, Seattle, Chicago, San Francisco, Philadelphia, Florida has a 50-year low in our crime rate. So how could that possibly be? If it's going up in these other areas, how could it be lower for us uh, as a relative matter? And it's not rocket science. It's a difference in priorities, it's a difference in leadership, and it's enacting good policies that are actually designed to protect the public safety. And we've done that. The, the sheriff mentioned some of the things that we did fighting back against defund the police. They were trying to, they, I know they slashed police spending for a while here in Illinois and in Chicago. They do it in Seattle, these other places. Uh, we said that that's totally unacceptable in Florida. And yes, we were not going to do that at the state level, of course. But, you know, we have 67 counties. We got all these municipalities. You know, any city council can have three bozos do something <laughs> stupid at any given time. So we took matters in our own hands at the state legislature, at the state level, and we said, uh, no jurisdiction in Florida 
is going to be able to defund police. If you do it, we're putting the money back in. We're not going to put these people at risk because you're going on some type of ideological joyride. Not on our dime. You're not doing it. So we were able to stand up uh, and really nip that in the bud. So you never saw that in the state of Florida with respect to defund police. Sheriff also mentioned how we responded to the, to the uh, BLM riots of 2020. Uh, as soon as I saw this going on in Minneapolis and starting to spread to like New York City, I called out the National Guard in Florida immediately. That's what they should have done in Minneapolis. You should have had the guard out there from day one and you could have stopped this. And now Minneapolis is a shell of its former self. People don't want to go downtown anymore. It's going to take decades for that to ever recover what it was. So we had the guard. We had our state law enforcement uh, stationed all across Florida. We were working with police departments, sheriff's departments. Uh, and we said very simply, uh, you're not burning down the state of Florida. And they didn't burn down the state of Florida. We were able to do. But we also understood that I had police officers out in some of these protests. And, you know, some of these people were throwing rocks at them, batteries, all this different stuff. And I'm just like, you know, you know, that's unacceptable. So our anti-riot legislation, I mean, it did two things. Really, one, it said very clearly, if you riot in Florida, if you loot in Florida, if you're engaged in mob violence in Florida, you ain't going to be treated like they do in Portland, where they bring you in, slap you on the wrist, take your mug shot, and put you right back on the street to do it all over again. No, in Florida, if you're doing that, you're not getting a slap on the wrist. You're getting the inside of a jail cell. And we're going to hold you accountable. But we also said that we are not going to let you attack police with impunity uh, when you're having these types of melees. And so if you do attack an officer who's there, they're basically just treated like sitting ducks, uh, you're going to have enhanced penalties. And we're going to make sure we treat that uh, with the gravity that it deserves. So we were proud to be the first state to really fight back uh, against the riot, rioting in a comprehensive legislative way, in addition to just taking executive action. And as all these other places were, were slashing police spending, I decided, you know, we're of course not going to defund police, but let's do something more. So in 2021, and we repeated it in 2022, we were able to give every single sworn law enforcement officer in our state, city, county, state agencies, we were able to do $1,000 bonuses across the board for everybody. And And the thing about, you know, in an era of high inflation, every little bit helps, and Lord knows you're not going to get rich being a police officer, but it really wasn't even about that. What it was is they got to open up an envelope. They had a check that I had signed for, that was actually because we pay the taxes, so it was like $1,300. You get a $1,000 take home. And so they're seeing that, and get, yes, it's nice, but it just was the signal that sent you know, as they're defunding police and attacking police in these other jurisdictions, the state of Florida is showing them that we got your back and we support what you're doing. So it was a huge boost for morale, uh, and people were really excited about that. We were able to do it twice in a row. And then we figured out, you know, some of these guys are being treated so poorly, places like Seattle, some of these other places, their morale is very low. We in Florida have an opportunity to capitalize off that. So we instituted a recruitment program, says anybody, and look, I don't beg people to move to Florida. I don't beg businesses, but I do ask for people in law enforcement who are qualified, just know we have this recruitment program in place. If you come and you're qualified from another state and join any of our agencies, city, county, state, sworn law enforcement, you get a $5,000 signing bonus immediately right off the top. And, and again, it's just showing that we really appreciate what they're doing. It shows that when you come to Florida, you're going to be treated with respect. But we do other things to have uh, good uh, benefits and ways for, for police officers. So, for example, we're a big school choice state in our K through 12 school system. And we're going to be doing more. I got a legislative session coming up March 8th, and we're going to be in for they're going to be in for a couple months. So we'll do more on this. But you know, in Florida, if you are low income, uh, you basically have the ability to take a scholarship 
uh, for your kid and go take it to the school of your choice, no questions asked. As the income goes up, uh, then some qualify, some don't. And so what you'll have is it's uh, some middle class families, because you may have a police officer and a teacher, you combine those incomes, maybe they're above the threshold. So what we said for police officers is uh, if you are on active duty, it doesn't matter the household income, uh, you all, 100% of you qualify for our family empowerment scholarship. So every police officer in Florida, Every police officer in Florida has the ability to use one of these scholarships uh, and send their child to the school of their choice if they so want to do it. And I don't think there's any other state that does that. So there's a lot of benefit. Oh, and oh, by the way, just so because we're here, um, and this isn't related to law enforcement, but not everyone knows this. You know, in Florida, uh, we have the most affordable higher education public system in the country. Tuition for in-state's about $6,200 on average. University of Florida is now in U.S. News ranked number five for public universities behind Berkeley, UCLA, Ann Arbor, and, and uh, University of Virginia. Grandparents who are Florida resident can qualify for in-state tuition for their grandchildren. So any of you, if you have parents down there and they're residents and then your kids want to go in state, you can go and trust me, as a parent, would you rather pay $6,200 for tuition or whatever the heck they're charging everybody else? But bottom line is, we've put our money where our mouth is when it comes to standing up for law and order. Yeah, you gotta set, you got to set leadership at the top, and we've done that, uh, but we've also recognized that it really only works because you've got a lot of people who are willing to put themselves on the line uh, to protect their, their community members. And, and that's what people do in Florida every single day. And they're able to do that with a sense of pride. And so what we've done has worked. And I think it's important to point that out as I come here uh, to Illinois, we were in Philly and New York. And, and, and again, I'm here saying come to Florida if you want to be a part of this with law enforcement because it's something that we're really serious about. But it's also broader than that because I can't have everybody moving to Florida. I mean, it's nice that people want to be, but you know, you've got to get some of these right. And here's what we know, particularly over the last few years. The reason why you have crime that has spiraled out of control in so many of these different areas is because you have politicians putting woke ideology ahead of public safety. And you see it now, I know in Chicago, you have all these candidates, they're all trying to outwoke each other. The left of the left is where they run, uh, and then they end up running on these platforms that destroy the communities they're elected to represent. And if you look back, it wasn't just since 2020, it was before that, but after 2020 summer, it ratcheted up where you had these politicians, you know, these woke people attacking and demeaning people wearing the uniform. You saw how ugly it was during those riots. I mean, the riots were bad enough because they're burning down all these businesses uh, and burning down people's property. And you had, you had like $2 billion in property damage for the Floyd riots. You had dozens of deaths uh, for that. Um, that didn't spark the same amount of outrage in some of our legacy media uh, as it should have. In fact, you'd have reporters standing in front of a birdie building saying that the, 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 it was peaceful, mostly peaceful. I mean, are you kidding me? So it was a total disaster what was going on, but the anti-police rhetoric and what they were doing, of course, that, defund, that, that fueled the defund movement, but even short of that, are you going to want to wear the uniform and go out and risk your life for a community that doesn't appreciate the sacrifice that you're making. Now, one of the things we're proud of in Florida is if you look at the people uh, who were serving in uniform, and not just police, but fire, Port Authority on 9-11, and were there at the Twin Towers, outside of those, the tri-state area where most of them were, Florida has the number one, we're the number one place for, for people that were there on 9-11. And when that was happening that day, I mean, we were obviously all shocked. But you saw these uniformed people running in there, risking their lives. Every single American was thankful uh, for what they were doing. We got to get back to that. We got to start respecting people who are willing to serve. And we just, we see this all too often now, and we just unfortunately saw one just this week in Philadelphia uh, where a police officer was murdered 
uh, by some felon. And my view on that is if you murder a police officer, you should get the death penalty for doing that. <laughs> But what we've created, I think, in Florida and what you need to see more of in places like Chicago and these other cities is uh, I can go to sheriff's departments, I could go to police departments, and you, you take a police officer that may have kids, uh, and that police officer could, grow, could, could look at those kids and say, you know what, uh, I would love for them to follow in my footsteps here in the state of Florida. And they would feel really, really good about that. I don't know that that would be the case in Chicago or in Seattle. Do they want their kids going up? No, they probably are working hard so their kids don't do that because of the way people are treated. And so that's when you know it's been a failure when the people would not want to have their own kids. So in Florida, people know that they want to do that. The other thing that you see with this uh, wokeification of law enforcement is passing ludicrous laws like eliminating cash bail. You guys just did that. Uh, and here's, here's the thing. New York did this a couple years ago. Everybody said it was going to be a disaster, but they were pursuing ideology. They were not pursuing the interests of the public. They were not worried about the interest of people wearing the uniform and their safety. They had an agenda, and they were trying to pursue that agenda. Well, what happens in New York now? If you have some, so police officer go out, risk their lives to be able to apprehend a criminal, you bring the criminal in, uh, and then they're in front of a judge, and in New York State, the judge is not allowed to consider whether that person's a danger to the community when they're making the bail decision. So what happens? They end up having to just release these people. So then you have the police officer who already had to risk his life to go into a situation to deal with this guy, then two weeks later gets called in to have to apprehend the same guy over and over again. How is that something that is good for public safety? And so it's been a total failure. Uh, why you guys would be doing it here after seeing how disastrous it's been is just beyond me. But I can tell you this, when I talk to people that come to Florida, yes, some of the main things that you think of, but they are really, really upset about what's gone on with the law enforcement uh, policies, not standing up for law and order. And the New Yorkers in particular come down and they are saying when they did the no cash bail, all hell broke loose. And that's exactly what you see. You guys are gonna see that unfortunately in Illinois. People are not going to be safe in their communities like they should because that policy is trying to pursue ideology over public safety. So that is wrong. And we are not going to do that in the state of Florida. In these states, when you see the failure, you've got to be man enough to stand up and admit it didn't work. Uh, and too few politicians are willing to do that, but people's safety is in jeopardy. The other thing that you see in these woke jurisdictions is the election of district attorneys, usually funded by large contributions from leftist billionaires like George Soros, and what they do, they get, the, they get the leftists of the left to win the primary, and then they're in a jurisdiction where they're going to elect a D no matter what. So then you get these prosecutors, and they come in with an agenda. And their agenda is they don't like the criminal justice system. There's a lot of laws they personally don't like, so they take it upon themselves to pick and choose which laws should be enforced and which laws should be ignored. But you know, if your position is you don't like a certain law and you want to do something about it, the proper response for a prosecutor is to resign your office, run for the legislature, and then try to change the law. You don't get to veto laws you don't like as a prosecutor. You don't have the right to be a law unto yourself. And so we see these big city prosecutors who've been put in. Uh, they make decisions to basically say, yeah, you can go ahead and rob people, and you're, never gonna, you're not going to be held accountable uh, as a result of this. I was talking to a guy that moved to Florida from San Francisco. Someone robbed his house. They called the police. The police go out there and said, well, we can file the report, but they're not going to pursue it. And I'm like, you're robbing somebody's house, and they just let that go? No wonder the quality of life is now in the toilet. In Florida, we let it be known uh, that we have no tolerance for prosecutors who are not going to enforce the law. Prosecutor in Florida says, 
uh, that they're going to ignore laws or nullify laws, uh, then we will take action. And in fact, we had one in Tampa who announced that he was not going to enforce laws that he disagreed with. And so I removed him from his post in Florida. So I think it needs to be something that everyone across this country, because you know, there used to be, you could be a Republican or a Democrat and still want law and order. So just because you're running in this Democrat primary, you don't have to elect the craziest person in the primary. So we need to start having an agreement that we're going to enforce the law uh, and we're not going to let people get into these positions as voters. Uh, who are taking it upon themselves to nullify the law. If you just did that, uh, you would see the crime rate drop in all these major cities. Trust me on that one. The other thing that we've done, and this isn't necessarily as, um, as prominent with respect to just law enforcement, but in Florida, we really take seriously the issue of K-12 education. And we believe in Florida that parents should be able to send their kids to school knowing that they're going to get an education, not a political indoctrination. Uh, and we've had some tussles on what's appropriate um, in the schools. We uh, tussled with uh, one of our companies in Florida that some of you may have heard about. Uh, it's got a decent sized footprint, but basically uh, we were in the situation to say, is it acceptable to send somebody to second grade and have a teacher tell them that they were born in the wrong body? Is it acceptable to have uh, teachers being involved in things like sexuality uh, with these young kids? And I would say in Florida, 90% of parents believe that that's not appropriate, and so that's what we do, and we make sure uh, that we're focused on academics and not all this other stuff. Well, Disney didn't like it, some others didn't like it, and usually when, um, you know, when you have some of these big interests rear their heads, sometimes these things fall by the wayside. Uh, but you know, um, they got everything they wanted for 60 years in the state of Florida, Disney did, until now. <laughs> we made it very clear that we run the state of Florida, they don't. And they had had for 60 years uh, huge subsidies. They actually controlled their own government in the state of Florida. Uh, and that is now coming to an end. Uh, so we have a new era of accountability. And then you also see battles over things like critical theory. They want to inject a very significant, I think, pernicious ideology uh, in the schools, uh, in, the, in the different subject matter. And we've said basically things like critical race theory um, are not appropriate for K through 12 schools, and so we don't allow that to be injected in. And a lot of people see, see some of the stuff you, you probably read about, and some of it is just really outrageous. What a lot of people don't realize is one of the things that flows from critical theory, and you've seen it in some of these cities, is teaching kids to have a hatred for law enforcement. They actually have things where they will say that law enforcement are gunning down racial minorities with impunity, you know, without any evidence. And, and that's just a slander on the people that wear the uniform. So the goal of critical theory with respect to police uh, is to basically sow a hatred amongst very young people uh, for those who are wearing the uniform. And in Florida, we reject that. Uh, that is totally inappropriate and that is wrong. But what we also do, in, in, in addition to say that shouldn't be taught like that or taught in schools, is we actually have programs now where school districts can work with local law enforcement agencies to let students go and observe and be a part of what's going on at our police departments and our sheriff's departments. Why is that important? Well, the kids go, and they're going to see a lot of people who are conscientious. They're going to see a lot of people that are public spirited. They're going to see a lot of people who are trying to keep their community safe. Uh, and they're going to develop an appreciation uh, for the hard work that people do, and they will develop a proper respect for what the people of law enforcement do. So we're totally different in Florida than what you see in all these other things. So woke education doesn't work. Woke 
uh, indoctrination about law enforcement doesn't work, and we're happy to be leading the charge on that in the state of Florida. But if you look at all these different things that these states and, and these localities are doing, it all goes back to putting ideology ahead of what's right for you. And that needs to stop in this country. We gotta start doing what's right for people. And so anybody who's interested in coming down, and yes, if you wanna come and just move down anyways, but if you wanna be a part uh, of our law enforcement community, just know uh, that the door's open. Uh, I can promise you that uh, you'll get support. Uh, I can promise you that you'll have communities that'll appreciate what you do. And I can promise you this, that in Florida, we will never ever surrender to the woke mob. Our state is where woke goes to die. Thank you guys. Thanks so much. Where do I go? Okay.